Hi, my name is Buck Woody. I've been presenting and teaching around the world for over 35 years. One of my most requested workshops is a one-day workshop that I give on creating a good presentation. Now, training and presenting are two different skills. This one focuses on presentations. I thought I might condense that particular workshop down to a simple session that you can go through to make you a better presenter. While I'll show the exercises that we normally do in class, I'll just briefly display them because we won't have time, obviously, to do that in this session. So with that, let's get started. We'll start out with a small assignment that I give in class. Now, what we normally do is you uh, create a five-minute presentation on a topic that I assign to you, so you don't actually get to pick the topic. And I give you that and I say, you've got a few minutes to prepare, uh, about 10 minutes, and then you're gonna get up and give it in front of the class, and that sort of sets a baseline. So if you'd like to do that now, feel free, but uh, there's no feedback. You might check with some friends and get some feedback that way. Moving on, let's talk about the agenda. So I normally start off again by shocking everybody with an assignment. And then we start with what we're gonna talk about first. We're going to talk about selecting the subject, researching, composing your topic, selecting your audience, your verbal skills and your confidence, how to deliver correctly with the mechanics that you need, and dealing with difficulties because in every session uh, there's always something that comes up that's unexpected. On our first topic, selecting the subject, We'll start out with why you pick what you pick and how you pick what you pick. Now, often these things are given to you. Somebody says, I need you to do a session on, or you develop a certain interest, but you need to hone that down to be even finer. One of the biggest mistakes that people make is they think they don't have enough material to cover the time, and quite often it's the other way around. The way to fix this particular problem is to define the subject very carefully. Let's talk about how you can do that. You might have heard that content is king. Well, I'm gonna push back on that a little bit. The content of your session is not king. Uh, the king is the topic that you've selected. So the way that you figure that out is to make sure that every piece, every part of your session supports the king, just like on a chessboard. So you wanna pick out everything you do only as it supports the topic you've picked. Now, there are various topic types that can help you get started. The first is to present whatever it is you're talking about in a, a version of features and benefits, like here's what this thing has within it and here's how that helps you. And you can begin to structure your talk that way. Next, you could do a case study. Uh, the benefits of using XYZ are described as this particular situation that I was involved in or that I heard about or that I saw. You could break it up into modules. Uh, this is often for workshops and classes. You'll create several modules, one of which leads to the other. And finally, there's compare and contrast. And what you do here is say, well, if you, if you know uh, about, let's say, this technology, here's how that maps to these ideas in this technology. So these can create several good ways for you to start structuring your topic. It's usually not a good idea to start mixing these. You'll want to pick a particular path and settle on that and go down it. Doesn't mean you can't use a case study as you're talking about features and benefits, but if you begin to chart uh, structuring your course this way, it can really be disruptive to your audience. Headlines sell. So the first thing you read, we call this clickbait uh, in the web. The first thing you read in the paper is something that draws your eye. So you need to create your title and then the abstract that goes with it. The title should be catchy, punchy, and get the point across. And then the abstract itself should expand on that. Here's how you can think about it. You could say in the abstract, what does this topic mean? Why is this important? Why should the audience care? And if you can't communicate that, you probably shouldn't be talking about it. And then why am I telling you this? Uh, at the beginning, I opened up by explaining that I've got some experience in public speaking. And that's useful because if you're going to listen to me about public speaking, it's a good idea to believe that I know what I'm talking about. And then you wanna definitely talk about what will you learn? And this is important 
Think about the verb to do. What will you learn to do? When you're done attending this session, you will be able to, and then list those things out. Now, it doesn't have to be worded exactly like that. You can get that idea across by using other verbiage. But at the end of the day, at the end of your abstract, it should definitely have within it, what will I learn? What will I use? What will I do with this information? And then at the very end of your session, this is the thing I see left off the most, is the call to action, CTA. And what are you going to do about it? Now that you know how to do this thing, you're 45% more efficient and you'll get a raise and your life will be better. Whatever it happens to be, you need to make sure at the end of the abstract there is a call to action. You will be able to do these things so that you need to have a call to action at the end of your, of your session. Now what we normally do here in the workshop is we give an assignment. And we rewrite that original topic that you had. And if you took a few minutes and paused and did your little session there, you can rewrite the title based on what you just learned. Then we pick a different content type or map, if you will, the, the different types we saw. Perhaps you didn't pick one of those. You tried to mix case study with modular and so on. Now's the time that you can restructure that. And then we create a new abstract, and again, this is the assignment in class, as if the product and your complete income depended on your selling it. And don't be afraid of that word sales. We're all in sales. Uh, we're trying to get our information across to someone. You need to make it bigger than life and then tone it back down. This is the best thing in the entire world and you'll be so much better because of it. Be effusive. And a lot of us are not willing to do that. We are very shy. We're not sure we're the smartest person in the room. And so we're very concerned about coming across a bit too salesy. Well, you won't. Uh, how you're perceived by the audience is usually far less than how you perceive yourself. So you need to raise your excitement level a level a bit higher. Now let's talk about researching and composing. First, let's talk about how you prepare your session. Get your main points out and you want as few as possible. Uh, you want three if possible uh, and then five, six or seven at the most. Again, when people leave your session, they've got a lot to keep in their head. And if they're going to a conference, let's say, or a course, they've got a lot of things in their head. Uh, so you want to make sure yours stands out. And the only way that happens is if you have fewer, simpler, punchier ideas. And so if you've got something to think about uh, that you're teaching someone, perhaps you want to think about faster, better, cheaper, or uh, easy to do, uh, quick to install, uh, easy to implement, and so on. So keep some small, punchy ideas in your conversation. Now, Keep in mind, even if you're doing a very, very technical presentation, you can still include this kind of structure when you're talking. Your graphics. Put them in later, and let's talk a little bit about the graphics themselves. They should only show state. They're not there for interest. You're there for interest. So you'll notice I don't have very many graphics on these slide decks, and I'm not afraid of PowerPoint or uh, Jupyter Notebooks or any other methodology of teaching. The point is to get the information across. We'll talk more about that in mechanics. But don't use a lot of graphics. Use them to show state. This is the way something is. And then perhaps you show an arrow, and then next you show uh, where we will end up. And this is where this changes. So we add a box, add a circle, add an arrow between them, and we explain that state transition. That's what your graphics are really for. You don't want to make sure you put everything on the screen. That's just not what you're looking for. You don't want a, a, an eye ransom note uh, going on there. Animations are very important, but should show movement from state to state. And theming is very important. You'll notice I have a very plain theme here. Uh, white on black, make your fonts very readable. And you can see these uh, themes throughout. You wanna make sure you have the same theme that you follow throughout the entire session. Now, again, back on the graphics, I, I don't want to say that you can't have some entertaining graphics. But if you're just doing a meme show from slide to slide, that can get very tiring mentally and it can also signal to the audience that you're not serious about your topic. Go with the flow. 
The flow options that you have are process, and inside process what we do is we go from this to do this, to do that, to do that. It's a flow diagram that can be circular or a tree or a graph, whatever the flow of what you're talking about is, follow that throughout your session. You could use chronological. First you do this, next you do that, then you do this. This is good for linear topics that require one thing before another or that you wait a day or a time period before the next iteration of what you're talking about. My favorite session type is the problem and solution. Here's the problem we have and you describe that and then you talk about here's how we solved that problem. Now whenever I use a problem and solution flow, I make sure I refer back quite often to the solution and where we are in solving it, uh, the problem that we're dealing with. Now this is the thing that surprises a lot of folks, especially technical presenters. You can create a story uh, and you should create a story. Um, and, and I've been asked many times, wait a minute, I'm doing uh, database backups or uh, Java code or uh, Hadoop or something like that. How in the world would I weave a story into that? Well, it's actually quite easy and it works like this. Uh, let's assume I begin to tell you about how to do a database backup and I explain that you need to make sure that uh, your backup location is set and all these other things. And I begin to tell you about the steps to do the database backup. About halfway through that process, if you're not taking notes or if I haven't created a bullet point eye chart on the screen, your mind begins to wonder because you're just not interested. But imagine I do this. One morning I came into work grabbed my cup of coffee, sat down at the computer and looked up and the database symbol on my dashboard was red. And I knew that meant the database was offline. And I knew a few minutes later, everyone was gonna come see me. So the first thing I did was reach for my backup tapes, my backup drive, my backup location to find out, do I have the latest current backup? Now you're invested in the story, and now I can begin to tell you the steps I followed, and I can even sprinkle within it things like, as I typed the restore test command to see if I was going to have enough room, I was a little worried about, hey, did I save enough room on this hard drive to restore the backup? And you're invested in that story with me, and you're listening, which is what you want your audience to do. That's an easy one. You can also talk to folks about, I've seen other people have this experience, or I read a story once where a person did this thing. So always include within your session a story. In fact, my favorite sessions, especially technical ones, are the ones where someone tells me a story from beginning to end as the session. It's actually quite easy to build a story. It's just three parts here, characters, settings, and situations. A person was in a place doing something and this thing happened. And there's a beginning, a middle, and an end. Now, the most important thing about a story is that it has to have conflict. When I sat down and got my coffee, I was relaxed, my day was fine, so I had to introduce into the story the conflict. My database was down. Do my backups work? Do I know where they are? Tune in next week to find out. You need that conflict. So you're gonna set up the conflict and then you're going to resolve it. You're gonna say, here's what I did to fix that problem. And at the end, you say, I went back to my coffee, which was now, of course, cold. So I had to go to the microwave, heat that back up, and continue on my day. You make sure you close the story out. The mind really wants to hear that. They love resolution. Now, demos. What do we do about demos? You have to have a demo, but a demo can go wrong it can take up far too much time, or it can be so complicated, you lose what you were trying to talk about. So the first rule of demonstrations is, yes, you should probably have them. People like to see that you're not just talking through something, you're actually demonstrating how to do it. And the main point to keep here is the main point. Uh, the idea is you should demo your point only. Don't demo other cool new things you found. I attended a class recently and a person was showing a particular thing that they learned that was really cool, but it detracted from what we were trying to learn. Keep in mind, your audience has not been living with the information that you're living with. And so you wanna make sure that you uh, keep on a clean path to where they get the information. Don't worry, they'll know you're smart. Don't worry, they'll know what you're doing. 
Next, make sure your demos are visible. Uh, the number one complaint, there are two complaints that I hear in technical conferences around the world in every culture. And the first one is, I couldn't see your screen. And we'll talk about this more in mechanics, but you want your demo to be incredibly visible. So only zero in on the part you care about, make the fonts large, use a screen and larger and so on. We'll talk more about that in just a moment. The point is if they can't see it, it's not that impressive and you have to practice. You have to practice and practice and practice and practice. In front of the mirror, in front of your family. Uh, my daughter uh, heard my sessions so many times that she could give some of them uh, when she was a young girl. So uh, practice is just absolutely essential. But with demos, it's got to be bulletproof. And we'll talk about dealing with disasters shortly. Uh, but the idea here is if you don't practice it, you won't know what could go wrong. And here's what I do with all demos. I have a backup. I have a screenshot. I have a recorded version of when the demo worked, ready to go with a double click right on the hard drive so people can see it. And if you have a problem, we'll talk about this, just move on, double click the demo and say, well, we've been visited uh, by the demo demons. And so we'll move on now and just show you what really works uh, and go from there. People are fine with that. They're not fine with you standing on the stage fumbling around trying to get your demos to work. This is especially hard if you're teaching a new topic or something that's a little bleeding edge to begin with, but you need to think about this before you get in front of everyone. Now, here we come to an assignment. What I have you do is write a story and you write a scene using the follow, uh, following elements. You've got someone named Yvonne, Christina, Douglas, don't call me Doug, I hate that, so that tells you what you need to know. Buddy and a guy named Skeets, for some reason. And the setting is a biological hazard lab. And then you take the scenario that you picked on your very first five minute assignment and you need to include some conflict. So you write up a story. This is all done just by writing things down. Selecting your audience. If you're going to give a session that you want people to like, if you want good scores, if you want people not to waste their time, you have to select who comes. Uh, you might think, wait a minute, I, I can't do that. <laughs> uh, the people come in from the sessions, I, I don't get to control who comes in and who comes out. You kind of do. The first is you need to create your pitch correctly. You need to make sure in your abstract, when you're telling people to come to your session, your course, your workshop, or your talk, what does your audience need to know? What will you tell them? And what are they going to learn to do? If you tell them these things, then they are more apt to self-select correctly. For instance, if someone talked to me about the best way to bake a, a chocolate cake, I, I might go hear that because I care a lot about chocolate cakes. But let's assume for a moment that I'm on the keto diet and I'm not allowed to have chocolate cakes. If you put into the session, we will teach you how to use uh, sugar and eggs and flour and lots of starchy things to make a cake, then I'm not going to come. And I won't rate your session poorly by saying, no, I really didn't apply to me. I'm always amazed at people who go to sessions uh, that they then say, well, that didn't really apply to me. Either the person wrote the abstract correctly or you didn't read it, which brings up an interesting point. I often read the abstract uh, from the stage during the session and I make this statement. Hey, if this is not what you're interested in learning about, that's kind of what we're doing in this session. So feel free to find one of the other fine sessions uh, here at this conference or uh, to tune out and grab something off of the internet to watch and read. I don't want to waste your time. And I've had people get up and leave the session, which you might think, oh no, I'm losing people. You don't want that. Actually, you do. Uh, if the person's not interested in your session, why should you waste your time, their time, and potentially a score you might get if they track such things? Uh, but the bigger point is wasting the time. Why do that if they're not interested in it? Let them go. Give them an opportunity to leave. And people are often surprised when I tell them, I'd rather have five people that care about what I'm talking about than a thousand that don't care what I'm talking about. Involve your audience. And what you do here is you ask questions. And, and you don't even have to wait for an answer. 
How many of you have ever had this situation? And you begin to ask the questions. Um, urge interactions between your audience and then encourage active listening. If you don't know what active listening is, we spend some time on this in the workshop, but I advise you to go out on the web and look up active listening and explain to your audience how they listen actively. You'll be surprised how much of a difference that makes in their engagement in your session. We have an assignment that usually follows this session. We have an abstract here with these elements. The person that uh, attends this session needs to know. The person that session assistant wants to learn. The person that attends this session has been working in this technology for. The person that attends this session wants to be able to. You need to practice that on your test subject that you originally developed multiple times so that you're able to make sure you can write a good abstract to involve the right audience. Now this is the takeaway from this session. Uh, so we've got multiple parts to this. We're going to go through again, but here's the session we have so far. Selling skills, what's in it for them, keeping it real and answering the questions. These are the things you should think about on what you just learned. Let's jump to the next module. We're now talk about delivery mechanics and what this really involves is how you give your presentation. Uh, this involves everything from the stagecraft uh, to the, the deck itself or whatever presentation tool you're going to use. We'll start with your software. Uh, we'll start with PowerPoint. Most of the people that I know that use PowerPoint, that complain about PowerPoint, have never taken the time to take any classes whatsoever on PowerPoint or read any of the help files. PowerPoint can be a very effective tool, as can any presentation method. I've presented using whiteboards. I've presented using Microsoft Paint. Uh, PowerPoint, of course, I've taught from Jupyter Notebooks. I've even used code on the screen, and I've even had my audience act out my slides instead of having a slide deck. Anything is appropriate depending on the audience and the topic you're talking about. The first thing you need to think about are is exactly what I told you earlier, which is use your graphics for state and movement from this to that. Here's the way it is. We add a box and now it's this and so on, just like they do on the cooking shows. Simple graphics and fewer graphics are better. That's just the, the long and short of it. Simple graphics and fewer graphics are better. Make your fonts bigger. Make your fonts bigger. Bigger is better. You should never have below a 14 point font on any slide and you should usually have 18 to 24 size fonts on any slide. Now here's an easy way to do that. Take your presentation, including your demos, put them on your laptop, assuming you've got a standard 10 inch or more screen, put that uh, laptop on a table and take 10 steps back. The view that you have of that laptop screen is the view that most people have in an average presentation hall. Now, if the presentation hall is big or you're speaking to many people, they may stage more screens or bigger screens. The point is, make your fonts bigger. There's almost never a time when larger fonts are a problem. Use the presentation view. If you've never learned to use the presenter view in PowerPoint or whatever tool you use, there's usually the ability to have your notes, the next slide that's coming up, I'm using them as we speak, uh, and a timer to keep you on time and so on. Very useful tool. Again, spend a little time uh, learning how to use the tool. I usually even print my notes view on paper, or these days I put it on a tablet, and I have that tablet sitting there just in case something goes wrong, or I can't split the screen. They can only duplicate the screen. And we'll talk more about dealing with disasters in a bit. Use your Zoom key. If you're using Windows, uh, Windows 10 or higher, the Windows Plus and Windows Escape will zoom in for you. If you can't see it from 10 feet away on a laptop screen, your audience can't see it either. And if you're rushing and you're the, blitzing past everything and they can't see the screen, they're not going to be satisfied. And no one likes sitting through something like that. Now let's talk about managing the session itself. First thing we need to think about is getting there early and preparing. Even if you're not the speaker, uh, the first speaker of that room, get there early, get your laptop booted up, make sure you're on Wi-Fi or internet or whatever you need. Make sure that everything's there. Look around the room, see how it's faced, see how the volume is and so on. 
Every time someone asks you a question during the session, repeat it out loud. Uh, many of you have had this uh, event happen to you. You're sitting in the session or perhaps you're watching it recorded and, and, and something like this happens. The presenter is talking and he says, yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. No, never do that. Well, that's very frustrating. <laughs> I didn't hear what the person said and I'm like, wait, what was that? So what you do is repeat the question. This gives you a few things that, that's an advantage for you. First of all, uh, everyone else gets to hear the question. Uh, secondly, it reframes the question to make sure you got it right. If I understand you correctly, you're asking, should the backups be kept for more than a day? Is that what you're asking? And that way you can reframe it to make sure you're answering the right question and shorten it. Uh, and then the third thing it does, it gives you a little time to get your mind in the right place so you don't just blurt out an answer that's incorrect. So uh, lots of advantages to repeating the question. And by the way, that's the number two most complained about. The first is the fonts and the second is the presenter didn't repeat the question. Slow down. Uh, we talk very quickly in our native languages, uh, quicker than most people can understand. Uh, I've got several friends that are really fast talkers uh, in multiple languages. And, and this is very frustrating to hear on a stage because your brain's trying to process new information. Slow down. And you're, you're thinking to yourself, oh wait, I won't be able to get the information across if I go that slow. That's okay. It's not a problem. Uh, slow down. Even if people think your session is too simple, that's fine. You'd rather them think it's too simple than too complex. Be enthusiastic. If you're not excited about your topic, nobody else is going to be excited either. So give yourself a little energy. Give the room a little energy. You don't have to tell jokes or run around the stage or scream developers, developers, developers. You can. Uh, makes it more interesting, but you don't have to do that. But if you're not at all emotive, if you're standing there very carefully and very woodenly and you're talking directly in a monotone, not looking at the audience, it becomes quite boring and the mind begins to wander. So vary your voice, vary your cadence, vary your speed. Uh, take some pauses. Pauses are great. They make people think. And that's what you want. And when you're done, this is a not so friendly request, get off the stage. Uh, when you're done talking, everyone wants to come talk to the presenter because they've got a million questions in their mind. Make sure you state from the stage, as soon as I'm done, I will walk out to the hall. I need to get ready for the next presenter to give their session. I'm usually that next presenter and I'm usually having to rush the previous presenter off the stage so I can test my stuff and get my screen set up. Get off the stage. Here's an assignment we have if we do the workshop. Create a deck for your presentation using only text. Create another one uh, using only lines, rectangles, triangles, or circles, and then mix them together. No graphics, but you have to use text, lines, rectangles, triangles, and circles to get your point across. Only those. And then uh, pare it down, and then you can build it back out. Verbal skills and confidence. The first thing we need to talk about inside your verbal skills are time management. We've alluded to this in some of the other modules, but you need to figure out your pacing and your timing. The only way you can do this, by the way, is to lay out the time you have, lay out your outline, and decide which topics need to get the most time. Lay those in and then make sure you have your time map and you've got to stick to it. Now, some people read their presentations and that's fine. I personally try to do more extemporaneous. Uh, in any case, make sure that you've got your blocking and your timing. This takes practice. It's the only way to do it. There's no other way to check your timing than to repeat it multiple times. If you practice one time, you will get it wrong. And then you'll either speed up in your presentation or you'll simply leave it out or you'll be done in 20 minutes looking at the walls. Uh, I've not had that latter experience too many times. Most of the time, you have more content than you need. But learn to pace yourself so that it doesn't feel rushed. Everything you talk about should lead to the king. Content is not king, your topic is king. If you find yourself talking about something that doesn't directly approach the topic, and our topic is better presentations, every one of these points should point to how to do a better presentation. If it doesn't, 
take it out. Just get rid of it. Make it another presentation if you like it that much, but make sure you take a look at that. It's always a good idea to make every slide. What is that person going to say next? What are they going to say next? You don't want a denouement. You don't want to uh, close out your session on every slide because people's minds will shut down and they'll begin to think about something else. So you want to make every slide, uh, what is he going to say next? Now, sometimes you have too much information. You're just not able to get it all in. Or you've got 30 points in, within the baking a cake steps. How do you handle that? Well, the way I handle it is I make a blog post. And then I give a, a URL to the blog post in the session. I use tiny URL or bit.ly or whatever you happen to use and shorten the link. And then I give them the link to the topics within my session so that they can go look and it sort of expands, uh, PK unzips uh, your session uh, into their minds later and it gives them something to go off with. Keep in mind, they're not gonna memorize everything you say. So it's a good idea to leave them some assets they can use for later. Practice makes perfect. We talked about this multiple times and it's true. Get yourself some time checks. And what I do are roadmaps. I know that I need to be at point one by this time period and I need to be at point two by this time period and I need to be at point three by this time period. And I can kind of adjust. I can kind of look at the clock and see where I'm at and figure out if I'm on pace or on time. Now, I say in here no ums, but I've been saying um quite a bit uh, in this session. Just did it there. That's okay. And when I say no ums, you don't want long pauses where you go, uh, um, this is called bridging inside uh, vocals. You, you don't want to have to bridge your topics from one to the other. Your brain wants that break. It wants a little bit of silence in between words and sentences and phrases so that it can rest on them. If you will watch a newscaster, you'll notice that they've got a very interesting cadence Pay attention to newscasters the next time you're watching television and you'll be surprised at how emotive they are and their cadence and the way they break sentences and so on. They don't just bridge everything with ums. Now, if you say um or ah uh during a session, that's not a problem. It's okay. But don't make that your primary bridge from sentence to sentence. Know what you want to say. This is important. I use the uh, stop gaps. In other words, I say, I need to be at this store by five o'clock and that ball field by this uh, time and I need to be at home by this time. So I have those in my head for my session and I know where I need to be. I don't memorize the whole session. I just memorize the points. Now, if I get a little fuddled and I'm lost and I'm not sure where I'm at, I know I need to get there so I can get back on track. Just know your main points and the directions of which you want to go. Also, make sure you're relating it back to the topic. All the time you'll say things like, this is why you're doing this uh, for these reasons. And that's the landmarks that I use, not turn by turn. I'm not good with uh, directions that just say, do this, do this, do this. I'm much better at saying, go to this landmark, go to this landmark, and this is an interesting way to think about it. The assignment for this section is to uh, make signposts. And basically what I want you to do in this one, we actually have some papers on the floor with your topic, big letters of your topic, and I have you walk to that section, give that topic, walk to the next section and give your next point, walk to the next section and give you that point. Uh, and it gets you used to this idea of a memory palace. And then um, if you're doing an actor or something where you're acting out things, I have you do charades. In other words, you don't get to talk. But how would you do charades around a database backup? I, I don't know. Be an interesting uh, examination, wouldn't it? And of course, now we need to deal with difficulties. Nothing ever goes as planned. Uh, no plan survives first contact with the enemy, I think is a very famous statement. So how do you deal with it? Well, the first thing you can have a problem with is your technology. Uh, and I've got three sessions that I always have in mind, even for this one that we're doing today. I have a high-tech solution, everything's working. My laptop's working, the camera's working, the lights are working, the screens are working, uh, I'm not hungry, everything's functional, I'm good, I'm ready to go. That's easy, that's the one we all plan for. But what happens if one of those things doesn't work? What if my slides wouldn't project? What if the camera was not working? What would I do? Now, it doesn't mean that's the way you want to present, but you need to be ready in case that happens. And what happens when everything fails? What could you get across with just your voice, 
just your face, your hands, and your feet. What could you get across? You need to be ready to do that, even if it doesn't happen, because it'll give you confidence later. Now, how about the people in the room? Sometimes they have an honest question. They're asking something that's um, off topic, but it's an honest question. How do you deal with this? Well, you deal with this by realizing the person is being honest. And so you want to keep us on track, but you also want to deal with their questions because it'll sidetrack them and it may sidetrack other people. I found the easiest way to do this is to declare at the outset how you're going to handle questions. The, the two methods are, I'm happy to take questions while we go, or I'll take questions at the end. The larger the group, the more I do at the end. If it's a smaller group, I actually like the interaction back and forth, and I'll answer it in one of three ways. That's a great question. Here's the answer. That's a great question. I have no idea. Uh, that's a great question, but it's not exactly what we're dealing with right now. How about let's get through this, and then we'll come back to that. Sometimes they're not clear about the question. This is why, once again, you always repeat the question. They begin to ramble and talk about something and say, I'm not sure I understand exactly what you're asking. Make sure you get clarity before you rush off on, our, on an, um, an answer. Uh, sometimes people are angry or frustrated. They don't agree with you. No, uh, Java is a terrible language. You should never use it. Uh, anybody knows you only use Lisp. That's, everything should be done in Lisp. And, and so you need to be able to diffuse that. So that's a great it's a great concept. Uh, we're covering this today. Happy to chat with you after this. I've had people leave the session because they just didn't agree with something, and that's fine too. Don't take that personally. Sometimes they have baggage they brought with them to the session. And sometimes you get the person that just needs a stage. They begin to talk and they fall in love with the sound of their own voice. What do you do with that? What you say is, I'm going to stop you there. Uh, because we need to get through some uh, more topics before we finish today. But I'm very interested in what you're talking about, so let's talk about that after. If, if you do that, they will never talk about it after. They want a stage, uh, they believe they should be up on stage, and maybe they should, uh, but not during your session. Always repeat the question. Here's your assignment. Write as many issues as you can that might occur during your session, and, and then be very specific. and then. Next to that in a column there, write down what would I do if this happens. Now, I do this still. Uh, I actually do this for every session I'm about to give. What am I going to do? And if I don't do it by writing it out, and I usually do, I at least do it mentally. But I don't even re rely on that. I usually try and make sure uh, that I go through and, and, and write it all out so that I have that down on paper and then I'm not worried, I'm not flustered. So here's our final assignment. The final assignment is, okay, uh, let's do the five minute presentation again on the topic that was assigned to you. How are they different? And usually by the end of the day, uh, these are dramatically different presentations than the ones we started off with. Well, I hope this session has been useful to you. I hope you're a better presenter when you're done, because remember, uh, at some point, I'm probably going to be sitting in your audience. And I don't want you to waste your time. I don't want to waste mine either. And I know you'll do a great job.